we learned how to do Lewis dot structures, we set out to understand how chemists are able to predict the structure of molecules, such as the glucose molecule you see here. But Lewis dot structures are only the first step. They tell us which atoms are bonded to which, and the order of the bond, that is, is it a single bond or a double bond, and so on. But what Lewis dot structures don't do for us is predict the 3D structure of the molecule. That is, how are the atoms arranged in space around each other? And that's what we'll talk about today. We use a simple principle to predict the spatial arrangement of atoms in molecules. That is, like charges repel. So electron pairs repel one another like this. Now to illustrate the point, let's take a look at this molecule, CH4, methane what we call natural gas. Now before going any further, hit pause and do the Lewis dot structure of methane. Okay, here it is. Now of course drawing the Lewis dot structure is the first step we take every time we want to do the 3D structure of a molecule. Now take a look at the four bonding pairs of electrons in methane. Clearly, being so repulsive, these bonding pairs want to get as far away from each other as possible, right? Now how can they do this? Well, let's imagine each bonding pair is represented by a balloon. If we had four balloons attached at the center, how would they arrange themselves to get as far apart as possible? Let's call on a student to help us out. Here's Bracken. Notice that as we pull all four balloons in towards the center, they automatically arrange themselves in a pattern. We call that pattern a tetrahedral pattern. Let's look at this tetrahedral pattern more closely. Here's Bracken with his balloons. Now the tetrahedron is one of Pythagoras' five perfect solid shapes. Here's one right here. We call the balloon pattern tetrahedral because the balloons point out towards the corners of a tetrahedron. This is a little hard to see in two dimensions on the flat screen, so let's rotate it. Now, as you can see, this is the best pattern for four electron pairs to get as far away from each other as possible. Now, we use the positioning of the bonding electrons to indicate where the atoms are in space. Let's put the electron pairs around the central atom in methane now. Next, the hydrogens position themselves with the bonding electrons. And so, the molecule itself is tetrahedral, because there's an atom at each electron position. Now, we can use these same principles to predict the shape of any molecule. Before we do, let's give the principle a fancy name, shall we? So we can impress our friends. What would you like to call it? How about Bob? Well, no, that probably won't impress anybody. Chemists prefer to give these sorts of things names that invoke mystery and wonder in the uninitiated. How about valence shell electron pair repulsion theory? Now that ought to wow the folks at home and make them think that they're getting their money's worth. We'll call it VSEPR for short. Let's apply VSEPR now to some other situations. We'll start with CO2. You know carbon dioxide, that stuff you exhale every time you breathe. Now just to get into the habit, you should hit pause now and do the Lewis dot structure of carbon dioxide. Okay, here it is. Next, we use VSEPR to determine the arrangement in space of the two oxygen atoms around the central carbon. And here's the critical question. 
How many sets of electrons are there around the central carbon atom? Notice I'm asking how many sets there are, not how many pairs there are. In fact, there are two sets. Even though there are four pairs of electrons, they're gathered into two double bonds, two sets of electrons. Now let's use the balloons again to illustrate how these two sets of electrons will position themselves to get as far apart as possible. Notice the balloons arrange themselves 180 degrees apart. And so this is exactly what the electrons will do. So the oxygen atoms will be 180 degrees apart and we say the CO2 molecule is linear. In fact, any molecule that has two sets of electrons and only two sets around the central atom will be linear. Let's try another one, shall we? We'll do BF3, which is called boron trifluoride. First we do the Lewis dot structure. Now, how many sets of electrons are there around the central boron atom? How can these three sets get the furthest apart? We'll refer again to our balloons. Notice that the electrons will point towards the corners of a triangle in this case. So we call this arrangement trigonal planar. And here's what the BF3 molecule looks like. Now we're going to throw you a little curve. Let's try doing sulfur dioxide, SO2. First, hit pause and try doing the Lewis dot structure. Okay, here's the Lewis dot structure. Now, how many electron sets are there around the central sulfur atom? It turns out there are three. Notice again, I'm asking not how many atoms there are around the central atom, but how many sets of electrons. Since 3 is the right answer, how will the electrons distribute around the sulfur atom? Let's review the balloons. So from the balloons, we learn that the electrons will arrange in a trigonal planar or triangular pattern around sulfur. Now let's position our oxygens. Okay, here's the curve. Notice that the electrons are in a triangular arrangement. But, what is the shape of the molecule? To answer that question, we need to define what we mean by the shape of the molecule. The shape of the molecule is defined not by where the electrons are, but by where the atoms are. So, look at the position of the atoms. The atoms define this shape. What would you call this shape? How about bent? So according to VSEPR, the electrons are arranged in a trigonal planar or triangular pattern, but we say the shape of the molecule is bent. Notice that there are two kinds of electron sets around the sulfur atom. The bonding electrons and those not found in bonds. We call the two unbonded electrons on sulfur a lone pair. So, to determine the shape of the SO2 molecule, we first decided what is the arrangement of electrons around the central sulfur atom. That was trigonal planar. But then, to determine the shape of the molecule, we put the atoms where they belong on this shape. The lone pair occupies one of the three positions. But we didn't place an atom at the position of the lone pair. So the lone pair doesn't have any effect on the shape of the molecule itself. This is the shape of the electron arrangement around the central atom. It's trigonal planar. But this is the shape of the molecule itself, which we call bent.
As you consider the way electrons arrange themselves around the central atom, you've probably recognized a pattern. We can prepare a table which summarizes what we've learned, in fact. On the left, we list the number of electron sets around the central atom. In the next column, we list the arrangement of these electron sets. And on the right, we show the pattern in space of the electron sets around the central atom. For example, when the number of electron sets around the central atom is 2, the arrangement of electron sets is linear. When the number of electron sets around the central atom is 3, the arrangement of electron sets is trigonal planar. When the number of electron sets around the central atom is 4, the arrangement of electron sets is tetrahedral. Now keep in mind that the table refers to the number of electron sets around the central atom, not the number of atoms. If there are lone pairs around the central atom, then that particular position does not determine the geometry of the molecule itself, as was the case with SO2. Now what happens if the number of sets of electrons is 5 or 6? Let's take a look at that question now. First, let's see what happens with five sets of electrons. We'll consult our balloons. Notice the shape that the balloons produce. We call this a trigonal bipyramid. And here's how we draw it. Now, an example of this shape is the molecule PF5, called phosphorus pentafluoride. Here's the shape of the phosphorus pentafluoride molecule. Okay, now let's see what happens with six sets of electrons around the central atom. Here are the balloons. They adopt an arrangement that we call octahedral. An example of a molecule with this shape is SF6, or sulfur hexafluoride. Hey, teacher, what's a trigonal bipyramid? Now we can complete our table of shapes. Why don't you hit pause and take a minute to look these over carefully and perhaps write down a few notes. Now could I suggest that you take another minute to look at the 3D patterns as they rotate and be sure you have a clear picture in your mind. Well, I bet you thought we were done, didn't you? Not yet. We still need to throw you one more curveball. To introduce this little twist, let's go back to our favorite molecule, water. Now, you've already done the Lewis dot structure of water. Here it is. Now, let's do the 3D structure. As you can see, there are four sets of electrons. There are two bonding pairs and there are two lone pairs. Now, thinking back to what we've learned, we'd predict that the electron sets will arrange themselves at the corners of a tetrahedron, right? Uh, we've tried to draw a tetrahedron here in two dimensions. It doesn't look so great, but now you uh, have this idea in your mind of what a tetrahedron looks like. You can imagine the water molecule in this shape. Now, of course, the shape of the water molecule itself is bent because we have two lone pairs in the molecule. Really nothing new so far. So where's the curveball? Well, here it is. It turns out that the lone pairs swell out and take up more room than bonding pairs. 
and this distorts the molecule from an ideal tetrahedral form. Let's see how this works. Note how the lone pairs swell and push down on the bonding pairs. Now this kind of thing happens every time there is a mixture between lone and bonding pairs in a molecule. For water, there are four sets of electrons, so those will adopt a more or less tetrahedral pattern in space. And that makes the molecule look like this. Except that we have to keep in mind when we see this kind of model that the hydrogen atoms will be a little closer together than in an ideal tetrahedral form. Undoubtedly your teacher will want to talk more about this with you. As for me, I think I've said enough, and I think I'll go get a drink of water. Oh, but before I do, let's use these buttons down here to illustrate some of these ideas. You can see the water molecule with its lone pairs. I can remove the lone pairs and show just the molecular shape, the shape of the molecule. And I can also show how the lone pairs swell out, pushing down, pushing in on the bonding pairs, squeezing the bonds together, so that the angle, the hydrogen-oxygen-hydrogen -hydrogen angle in this molecule, is actually smaller than you would expect from an ideal tetrahedral shape.